Let's see. And here we are. Uh, let's see. Viewer activity in case there's no, no super chats yet. We'll see. Um, all right. Well, we could start this show. Let's, um, oh, I, I think we're live. Are we live? I think we're live. We're, we're on, we're broadcasting, which I must have hit, I must have made us live and not even realized it. So people are getting to see a little bit behind the curtain, as it were. So what do you say, Trash Panda? Let's do it, buddy. Here we go. God, I love seeing your metal face with that kiss picture. Come on, man. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood Podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? <laughs> Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder. Actually, soaking wet master of fun and wonder. I just jumped out of the shower. Uh, and especially your pharaoh physical media. That's right, Robert Marbernet. And here is Let's Get Physical Media. Can you believe it? 75 episodes. This is the 75th episode of this show. But you know what? It isn't a show. It isn't a show without your favorite German my favorite German, everyone's favorite German, all the way from Saarbrücken, Deutschland, Mr. Dieter Bastian. Dieter, how are you today? Rob, always show ask me when you say my hometown name, but before we get into that, greetings, imagination, gonna sue us, Dieter here, here I am, rock you like a hurricane, and welcome to the B&B Motel, where let's get physical media, but we cover all stuff of entertainment, but physical media is should be at the heart of our show. And Rob, let me just start with one of the first points of the live chat from last week, because someone said, I may sound, uh, Morgan times four said, I may sound stupid, but what is the word Rob says before Deutschland? When introducing Dieter, it sounds like Saarbrücken, but Saarbrücken. can it be right? Uh, Saarbrücken. And Morgan times four, this is just my hometown. Is it spelled like this? And if you don't like the dots above the U, you can use U-E instead. So this is how it's spelled. Saarbrücken? This is just an, yeah, you can just use the U and E instead of the, you know, the, the two dots. So Morgan Times Four, this is just my hometown that Rob says at the beginning of the show. And you wonder where this is in Germany. It is the smallest capital from the smallest county. So it's practically Tatooine, you know? Saarbrücken is practically... <laughs> You've never described it like that before. <laughs> so, Rob, what a rocky week this uh, week we have. And considering I remember the Judas Priest song, some heads are going to roll. What is happening at your old company, Rob? What is happening there? Uh, well, Dietz, you know, uh, no man can say. No, I think the act of Zaslav is, is the axe of Zaslav is swinging. Um you know, we we uh, we are seeing. Um, I think we're seeing the the. There's a lot of debt that that company is carrying. They have to get rid of it, and really, they have come to the real realization that should have been come to a long time ago, and and they have been saying that putting hundred million dollar movies on streaming is a fool's errand, because you know you do remember the heady days of the early '90s when James Cameron was making Terminator Two and it cost a hundred million dollars, oh, yeah. and people were like a hundred million dollars. What? And yeah, it did. It cost $100 million. I, I remember, Rob, when, when Terminator 2 had at my theaters, and after the first 10, 10 minutes, somebody said, this was the first $10 million. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's you know, yeah, because the opening scene. Yeah. Um, but the the you know it, it's true. I mean, look, I've always said we've been saying this on the, on the John Campy show for years. I've always said that if you're spending a hundred million dollars on a movie, put it out in theaters, especially if it's a Batman related film. I mean, obviously. They didn't think the Batgirl, for whatever reason, was good enough. And look, would in this day and age, would you have put out Halle Berry's Catwoman movie? As much as I love Sharon Stone, in the wake of where we're at now in terms of comic book movies and comic book entertainment, the last thing that Warner Brothers put out was Matt Reeves' The Batman, which whether you love The Batman or not, it was a prestige picture. It was approached in a very serious manner. It was beautifully directed. It was definitely prestige programming for Warner Brothers. And unless you're reaching at that level, I mean, obviously we saw the um, announcement for the Joker, Folly Do, the second Joker movie. Same thing, $65 million spend. That movie made a billion dollars at the box office. A billion dollars. Even if you doubled the budget of $65 million and amped it all the way up to $130 million for marketing costs, that is an enormous profit. That's what the studio wants to see. And if but they're if, making, considering Choga, this was not expected at, at all. For no, my, for my. And if, if they're yeah. not getting that level of return, I think you know they look at it and they're like, you know what? If we put this movie out, it can one. If it's not up to the level of the Batman or Joker, then we're not going to release it. And you know, the Bat Batgirl was was the 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 whole approach to it was more for going direct to streaming. Why a movie like that? Look, I I, I am of the opinion that studios no longer even know how to make movies. I mean, you look at The Joker. You, Joker was a beautifully made film at $65 million. It had scope. It had, I mean, it looked like a cross between a David Fincher movie and, and a Batman movie. I mean, it was beautifully made. Studios need to figure out how to make movies, once again, in the 45 to $75 million range. I would say that that should be the mandate, and those movies should be theatrically released. the The cost of these films has spiraled way out of control, and you know I've always said from a philosophical standpoint, if you have two hours of time, you can watch a YouTube stream like this stream is usually two hours, or you can go see a movie like Matt Reeves' The Batman. This stream costs you nothing to watch unless you want to support the channel via super chats and tips or memberships, which we appreciate, but. You don't have to pay for it. It's still two hours of your time. Now, if studios aren't making sure that those two hours are the most prestigious, most emotionally and, and uh, entertainment, if they're emotionally satisfying, if you're not getting entertainment, why are they spending $100 million if they're not going to get a return? I mean, philosophically, it's a pretty interesting question from a business perspective. And if they're going to cancel Scooby-Doo, like, I, I mean, I'm not... Animation movies don't matter that much to me, but was Scooby Doo really that bad? I mean, maybe at forty million dollars they were going to spend another ten or something. Again, if you can't release it theatrically, knowing you're going to make three or four hundred million, why do it? You know, why do it at all? And I, and I think that that question is something that Hollywood hasn't asked for a while, and they're going to have to ask. They're going to have to ask it. They're going to have to ask that question. And I think David Zaslav is not asking the question. He's He's decisively acting on what he has to do that's best for the company, good or bad. Um, it to was that... uh, tough, tough considering the movies were almost at the finish line both. And I think if David Zaslav yep. would have been the chief two years prior, we wouldn't have gotten our Jack Snyder's Justice League. That's, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I mean, no, I, we, we probably wouldn't have. But, I mean, with Zack Snyder's Justice League, yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting case. And, frankly, I think they're wondering... Did they make their money back? Did they were they able to okay. translate? And I, I I would say probably not. You know, I mean, I really like Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'm glad it exists. But again, you know, these are tough economic questions, and we as fan people mm -hmm. need to put aside our our like this has to happen. It's so and so's vision. It's it ain't show friends. It's show business. And if you ain't gonna do no business, you ain't gonna have no friends. So uh, David Zaslav doesn't have to be like look. Am I, a bu am I bummed out for these two directors? Yeah, because it seriously curtails their career because yeah. people are going to be like, oh, forever the stigma of, of whether it's Leslie Grace, all those people are, I feel bad for them. I mean, I, I would hate to be in their position. I know what it's like to have projects scrapped, but 
you know, we live in a new age. And if, if I was directing a Batgirl movie that was going direct to streaming, you know, as directors, I would have said, you know what? They should have said, let's make this for $65 million. You know, it was supposed to be 70 or whatever. Let's make it for $45 million. I mean, if they're doing episodes of CW shows like Batwoman, how much do those cost? And now, so why does a Batgirl movie cost so much money? I mean, I know you up the, just figure out ways. Go shoot it on the streets. Don't don't rely so heavily on special effects. I don't know how. I don't know anything about the Batgirl yeah. movie. Maybe it was good, but so anyway, those are just my thoughts. But it was it, a bummer of a week. Was, yeah, yeah. But considering the stuff we got this week, we've got Sandman on Netflix. Oh. We've got Prey movie on Hulu. So we got a lot of good stuff considering the entertainment. Yeah, I mean, the flip side to that is why didn't they yeah. release Prey in theaters? I know it was just going exactly. on to Hulu. No, here, scooch that over. There you go. Um, and Did you – I, I have not watched Prey. You know, for the most part, I mean, a lot of people really loved it. I know, like, Critical Drinker was sort of mixed on it, and a lot of people are, are mixed. But a lot of other people are saying it's the best movie since the original, if not surpassing the original. Rob, I already watched it twice. Wow. That's how much I liked it. Rob, well, that's a ringing which endorsement. Ha- which would certainly happen. But considering the movie is just 90 minutes plus uh, 10 minutes credits, so it's not really a, a very long movie. Right. Like we're used to, you know, two, two and a half hours. And it was just a great movie, what you want from a better. Great locations, Rob. No green screen at all. So you don't have any, you know, the kind of studio feeling that you get. Always shot nice on the outside, so I didn't detect any green screen trickery, you know. And it well, has yeah, they probably course. went out and shot it on location. It looked yeah. like they did, and it had a great sound design, Rob. And you can always get me with a great sound design in a movie. Sound was great, the score was great. Really love it. Of course, some Ubers played a Vogue uh, card again, but for me, if you pay attention, she's not really. A Mary Sue, you know. Uh, I think the I didn't see the trailer, but I think the trailer was not that particularly uh, good. I heard, considering selling the movie, but right. for me it was totally at Charles Los uh already saw it at San Diego Comic Con and liked it. And I have to say, yeah, it's definitely uh, earned the praise that it's gotten. Well, I mean, totally I think that loved it. I also think that look, I, I think that fan criticism has gone over a wall. Where I, I think objectivity and a- actually being able to look at something and truly review it for what it is has sort of gone around the bend. Right. I mean, and and I, I think we need to pull back and like, look, I, I feel that way. Like, as you know, I've wanted to see the, the Sandman translated. The Sandman's my favorite comic book series and getting the, getting the show from Netflix uh, and seeing how much care and how much love was put into the adaptation. Uh, I, I, I really find it delightful and... While they, you know, they had to get rid of the direct ties to the DC universe, which I understand, it actually makes I think the show more concise, and the fact that you've moved it outside because when when Neil Gaiman first started doing the Sandman, it, 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 he hadn't quite figured it all out yet, and in my mind, it really gelled with the the eighth uh, issue, The Sound of Her Wings, and they did that in the sixth episode and they also combined it with with this character Hob Gadling and I think they did a, a really great job of it you know and I think that there's a lot of people that that there's a lot I, I see that there's a lot of talk of gender swapping characters or race swapping characters and it's really interesting to me because like even Morpheus our main character the Sandman is shown in the fourth episode as being both black and white as he was because dream of the endless was around in Africa where there were no white people. <laughs> you know, humanity had not, uh, people hadn't spread out across the the uh, the planet. So he's actually shown, we see him, he talks about uh, his queen, the, his love that, that spurned him, and he, he sent her to hell for 10,000 years. That's right out of the comic. And you see him the way she saw him, the way he appeared to the people 10,000 years ago as a young black man. And th- this is baked into the comics. So these characters, they're not, they don't really look like that. They're anthropomorphizations of these entities. So they can look however they want. I wouldn't be surprised if you would see other actors take the roles of these characters in seasons two and three and four. I mean, maybe not Morpheus, but 
like Lucifer Morningstar is being played by Gwendolyn Christie. I could see that being recast if you wanted to, to a whole different person, you know, a different maybe, because then they could show you that these are entities that look however they want to look to whomever they want to, you know. So that kind of thing doesn't bother me at all, if, especially if the characters are creations of Dream himself. They can change. So, I, I, but that to me, that that those reviews, that's that's not a review of the story. That's not a review of the execution, really. That's 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 a very superficial review of the show. And I think for what it is, the story that it's telling. And I said the story's not for everybody. I I made the point last night on my live stream. I said, you know. If you like the movie Amelie, Amelie and the Sandman have a same, this, they're very different in terms of their tone and things, but they have the same sensibility, and I think they appeal to the same kind of person. So if you're a fan of like Jean-Pierre Genet's Amelie, you're probably going to like the Sandman. Uh, and the Sandman still has its horror elements. A lot of bad shit goes on. People get blown up. A lot of violence. You know, it's, it's great. I love it. <laughs> they did a good job. I've only... I've only watched the first two episodes, so I'm not really at my final judgment considering the Sandman. Rob, if you haven't watched Prey, Hulu gives you the opportunity, if you want, to watch it with a Comanche dub. Mm -hmm. You know? And I get it that people said it would even be better if it were done in Comanche. But we all know how many people don't like to read subtitles. And you can't do that with a franchise movie. You know? But you can, if you want, Rob, Hulu has the option to watch it in a Comanche dub, you know, but it's just a dub, not really the mouse moving, it's not really uh, fitting, you know Yeah, but, uh, well, but I'll watch it, you know, that, that doesn't I, it doesn't bother me, I mean the fact that, the yeah. fact that, you know <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's a predator movie in the 1700s, they didn't have movie and, cameras back then anyway <laughs> And considering, considering Bray Rob I want that movie on physical media, okay uh, Well, maybe it'll get I mean, it was and here it was out on uh, Disney Plus under the Stars banner. Yep, and yep. Uh, a little bit of a positive note here. There was, I watched it on, on, on Hulu a little bit. Here there is no watermark at the bottom. bottom oh, nice. Here. So that means, that means uh, Stinky Tuna can rip it off and put it out on physical media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. wait. Because I want, I, want my, I want my disc. I want my disc. Yeah, I'm, somebody will put it out. Because, because I love I loved Bray. Um, I love it. Well, if you love it, you know you know who else loves it. Um, Two hundred Watt Studio loves it and says, ha okay. uh, "Hail, good to see you." Prey was really good. Um, awesome. And then Marcus Bismuth says, "Warner Brothers yeah. learns a lesson from movies like Cats and Fantastic Four. You know, Marcus makes a really good point. I mean, were those movies beneficial to the studio to release Cats to spend all that money making that movie? I mean, how much did they lose on that? I think you know, in a way." In a way, we we have had studios have been floundering. They 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 launch these products and they think to themselves, okay, we've got Academy Award winners, we're gonna make a movie Cats. And I'm like, from a from a perspective, you could look at a spreadsheet and go, okay, well, Cats has been a an incredible incredibly popular Broadway show for over forty years. Is it going to make a good movie? Like, can you put actors? Yeah in those outfits and make people buy off on it. I would say that, you know, <laughs> that movie really didn't work. And so by not releasing it, I mean, who knows? And perhaps you should have recognized that in the, in the beginning stages of the production. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I will say this, though. Uh, some people are talking, like Tim Hans is pointing this out in the chat. Yeah. Uh, I think Prey should have been theatrically released. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I think with a marketing it, campaign, that that movie could have made a couple hundred million dollars. Yeah. So, it, it could, but but second says the last, the last one, the last one was not really that well received. So I don't know about that. But considering the look and the feel of the movie, it totally was a theatrical uh, uh, release. Yeah, and and what I loved Rob, that still the 20th Century Fox logo was at the beginning of the movie. Yes, which is cool. By the way, Seca says Prey was terrible, mediocre at best. See, I, when I hear what I what I, I I don't know what that means. If you're going to say Prey was terrible or mediocre, why was it terrible or why was it mediocre at best? Um, and it, it's interesting to me the this kind of um, 
response because I've heard it's it's people have said that they don't like it, and um, it's uh, a little bit uh, divisive. But I think the most people dug it. For me, yeah, like, like I, I, I said, I've I seen already, more people. I already watched it. Watched it twice. And, and people, uh, people uh, that I trust really liked it. So, yeah. Um, We'll be we'll be uh, waiting to hear your your judgment next week, Rob. If you yeah, I can't wait. To, I can't wait to watch, watch, it. It. watch it. I'm really excited. Okay, uh, but you know, I had for all mankind episode nine. I had Sandman. Yeah, I, I have to. I finished I to, uh, uh, Blackbird on Amazon Plus, which to. I quite enjoyed. Dennis okay. Lehane's uh, nice. with Taron Egerton. So yeah, so where are we at now? What's going on, Deets? Uh, where we do we start, Rob? A little bit of the live chat. Yeah, Can why not? Give us some uh, give us some live chat from last week. Okay. Previously on Let's Get Physical Media of last week, first one I started already. The next one, Agent Silver Fox. It said, "I get more connection with physical media. Streaming has its place, but there's less emotional connection." Exactly, Agent Silver Fox. Nothing is more thrilling. Put out the box, you know, put in the disc and get ready for the movie. You know? uh, Michael Nichols said, "I've gotten back into buying because of because of this show." This week bought X, Lost Boys, Salem Slot, and I Am Legend. Two weeks ago bought Raging Bull, The Batman, have an order in for I Saw the Devil. So Michael Nichols, you've done everything correctly, I see. I Saw the Devil's great. Yeah, totally. I love I Saw One the of Devil. the Korean. Yeah, that's Korean that's pinnacle of Korean. Uh, yeah. Call it thriller, Definitely. horror, call it what you want. Yeah. The Alex Sorber, physical media collectors have never had it better. This is the golden age. Considering perhaps his take on it, I heard some stuff has vanished on HBO Max, Rob. Yeah, I mean they took they like American Pickle, you okay. know, and, and again they've removed movies off of HBO Max, and these are movies Great. that were like made for HBO Max. So I'm yeah, it, it, I'm, they were not licensed uh, stuff. No, and okay. I'm curious again uh, what the what the deals were if they left it on for a certain amount of time. They probably had payouts to. To talent, it's fascinating. It's it's really fascinating. Uh, all of this, so it's going to be weird to see how it all shakes out. Look, the business is in flux. It's changing, as it should. Yeah. Uh, the next one, a strange question, Rob, from Juan Rodriguez. Hi, Rob. Do you have any Legend of Zelda collections? I I, do, I, I don't. <laughs> I have no legend. You know, I mean that was that was a game I, that I liked the game, but I that was in a part of my life where I was not playing video games. I was out. Yes, you know what? I'll, I'll flat out. So my video game life, I had an Intellivision and a ColecoVision. Then I was out. And then I got a N64 probably 10 years later. And I, I got an N64 because I wanted to play Shadows of the Empire. So And then I got a GameCube. And, um, and then my first PlayStation was a PlayStation 3. Even though I, I played a lot of PlayStation at my friend Sean's house, he had a PlayStation. Oh, no. No, no. That's wrong. I got a PlayStation 2. I played a lot of the original PlayStation, then I got a PlayStation 2. And that's when I was playing things like uh, um, uh, Twisted Metal Black and, and, and stuff like that. And then I got a PlayStation 3 because it had a Blu-ray player in it. Um, this girl I was dating at the time, Mary Forrest, gave it to me. And now I've got an Xbox X and a PlayStation Five, so I never really played Zelda. No, yeah, I mean not. This, I, I dabbled for, in it. For me, it was it was a strange question because I thought, where did he get this connection that Rob has a, a big affiliation with Nintendo with Nintendo uh, stuff? But okay, here we go. Applecheck said, "I watched first episode of Paper Girls. I love it so far. This is a new show on Amazon." I believe. Do you know anything about it? Yes, I have. I have Paper two. Uh, it's a comic adaptation. Okay. And I like the comic book quite a bit. Um, it was something I got into with Schnepp and when I was streaming with John Schnepp and Amy Dallin, and I liked it. You know, and it's it's got this time travel element. I have not watched the show yet. There, there are two shows. That being the second one, also yeah. the Shining Girls uh, with Elizabeth Moss. I think I think that's okay. on Apple. I read that book. I think Lauren Bukes wrote it. Um, it's it's a very interesting kind of horror serial killer uh, thing, and uh, it's 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 really interesting, really interesting. Okay, nice. So uh, 
Paper Girls, let's see how the show will do for Amazon. Goopy G, Dita, Dita is the best, okay, I don't know about that. Where in Germany are you from? Okay, we we established that at the beginning, okay. Saarbrücken. Did you, did you grow up there? Were you born there? Are you yeah, a lifer? You're a Saarbrücken yeah. lifer? Exactly, exactly. Do you ever leave? Uh, just for holidays, but not really. Not really. Wow. So born, born and raised here. All right. No, no judgment. Video hunter. No judgment. Yeah. Rob. That's why you buy what Video you buy. Video hunter D. <laughs> Video hunter D. Rob should make a bunker and put his collection in it so the films will survive maybe the nuclear war. Well, if they can survive the heat here, maybe they can survive the nuclear war. But the problem with yeah. nuclear war is that you also have to have power. You have to have solar power. You have to have Blu-ray players and 4K players at work. You have to have a TV and a good surround sound system. So exactly. maybe one of those uh, maybe one of those elites that live in New Zealand will have the ultimate <laughs> way to survive. Altmetall said, I got the US disc of Believer, the movie I showed. Very nice movie. Exactly, Altmetall. Nicolas Slide TV, Rob and Dieter, this is more perhaps for Rob. Are you guys like Invasion of the Astro Monster? Wait, wait there, was a li- there was a little glitch in the world. Matrix. Uh, say that one more okay. time. One again. Rob and Dieter, are you guys fans of classic Godzilla movies like Invasion of the Astro Monster and The Son of Godzilla? Come on, dude. Invasion of the Astro Monster, a.k.a. Monster Zero. I have that criterion set. I love I love Monster Zero. First of all, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the controller. I love happen, hap, hot Japanese girls in black and like silver lame, whatever, that are actually aliens. I love classic Godzilla movies. Although I have to say, my favorite classic kaiju movie is the original Rodan. So, but I love, and why it wasn't in the set, I mean, I know it's not Godzilla, but man, I love classic kaiju movies. So, I'm in. Count me in. Tom Jr. Jackson is in the live chat, Rob, and he informs us, like you said, The Shining Girls is on Apple. Yeah, it's on Apple. It's, on it's Apple. a really, uh, I, it looks great. I haven't seen it yet, but I read the book. I have it right up on my shelf up there, awesome. actually. Awesome. Awesome. Video Hunter D came back. I have Superman Returns on HD DVD with Rob's special features. Well, Video Hunter D, <laughs> you're not alone on that. Okay? It comes with. Like like it says here, three hours of exclusive depth documentaries. Wait a you minute, know? you're out of sync, I buddy. Have that... Wait a minute, you're out of sync. Oh, hold hold okay. on a second. Hold on a second. Let me let me come back to you. I don't know. I don't know why Dietz is out of sync right there. I'm noticing he's out of sync. Uh, let's try it again. Are you... Perhaps it's okay. You're still out I of have... sync. I have I have that stuff too. Now you're in sync. Like like you should. He's in sync. Three hours documentary. So, Altmetall said, "Great new considering we had some cover issues last week. Of course, some people chimed in. Rob, Altmetall said, great music in Lost Boys, definitely. And Paul in Long Beach, jeez, they would have done better with the, the shirtless sex player as a cover motive. Oh my definitely. God, yeah, Paul in Long Beach. I still believe, definitely. I still believe." And, Leave Aaron Johnson. Both covers are not great. Here comes the kicker. But Poltergeist cover art seems to be better than Lost Boys. Okay, Aaron Johnson. I don't know what you're talking about. That was they're both kind of lame. Yeah. I mean The Alex Orba. The Alex Orba said, I have an or an original one sheet for free enterprise. Well, Alex Orba, here's a tip from me. Don't send it to that guy for a signature. You will probably never get that one sheet <laughs> ever back. So leave it hanging in your room for free enterprise. And considering free enterprise, Ray Garden, when are we getting a steelbook free enterprise? Well, uh, Ray, the movie has to be metal first to get a steelbook release. You know, just saying. Oh, <laughs> you're gonna like the new version. You will probably, you will probably the only thing that we will get will probably is a flimsy, flimsy diggy. That is not true. Enterprise. God, you know, next year is its 25th anniversary. I got to get to something with it. <laughs> and you know, Rob, I will buy it if you sign it. Fuck off, you douchey douche. <laughs> okay, you know? uh, that's, yeah, that'll be my signature. <laughs> Aaron Johnson, 
came back. The Poltergeist cover is interesting, but the Lost Boys cover looks like someone had put a neon sign on the side of a bridge. Yep. Dirty Soul Monkey. Apart from No Time to Die, the Craig Bond 4Ks are upscale. Dirty Soul Monkey, I don't think you're right about this. As far as I know, only Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace are upscales. I think, considering Skyfall Spectre uh, at 4K Masters 2, but I could could be wrong. So I think three of the five are really 4K Masters. Pick this energy. I want Stranger Things on Blu-ray. Some streaming stuff we all want on Blu-ray. Ray Garden came back, considering 007. I'm making my way through the Bond movies in order in honor of the 60th anniversary, and I'd just like to say what a great and unappreciated Bond Timothy Dalton was. Yep. Agreed. Chuck Keyworth uh, answered, Greg is in the same boat as Dalton. Terrible scripts and will be mostly forgettable. Well, Chuck, I don't think that is the case, considering Daniel Craig, considering I have a lot of worker colleagues, they are way younger than me, and for them, Daniel Craig is like, no. And the Craig movies did make a lot of a lot of buck. A lot of buck. Stop and make shave. This was actually in a super chat this morning. I will repeat it here. here. It was just in the live chat. Timothy Dalton is great. I watched Moonraker last week. It took five stiff drinks to bypass my brain for the second half of the movie. <laughs> I think it was in the super chat this morning on your show about the sentiment. Yes, he did say that last night, and uh, he's right. One one day I'll release my drunk Moonraker commentary. I know where it we'll is. Get get, we'll get to that in a minute. Here. <laughs> Considering my contract with my show friend here, I thought if you give Dita Tom Junior Jackson, Tom Junior Jackson said, I thought if you give Dita a sock and it will free him. Well, you can try Tom, but unfortunately, I haven't didn't read through the fine print at the end, you know. I thought it was show friends, but I had to learn the hard way. It's show business. <laughs> That's right. Even Video Hunter D said, we will find a way to free Dida. Good luck on that. Get the lawyers ready. <laughs> Mr. Cage asks, Rob. What, are people trying to liberate we... you from your contract? Uh, yeah, I have no, no idea. Mr. Cage, how can you not like piano, Rob? Oh, come on. You mean uh, James Campion's film? Look, yeah, the, 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 you showed last week will come out. Uh, I just how you know sometimes m movies just strike you the wrong way. I, I, uh, I, I found that to be a film that I just couldn't relate to in any way, shape, or form. Maybe it was just too muddy. I mean, muddy. They're actually in the mud the whole movie. So you know, and the Harvey Keitel relationship with uh, with Holly Hunter is a little weird. I uh, just didn't dig it. Didn't didn't vibe on it. Didn't work for me. Jane Campion yeah. is a director whose sensibility is not my sensibility. For whatever okay. reason. Whatever reason. There you go. Dirty Soul Monkey. Does Steeds own Star Trek into Darkness 3D? Dirty Soul Monkey, but just between you and me. Yes, but don't tell anyone. Okay? Uh, you know what? So do I. Shh, Rob. Don't but I fucking, anyone. it doesn't mean that I don't hate that movie with every fiber of my yeah. being. It's got exactly. The, exactly. Star Trek Into Darkness. And the, three, and, the, and, the, and the 3D is, is uh, not really good. Considering no. you have uh, too much of shaky cam in it. Tim Hens asked myself, have they heard of Bob's Burger in Deutschland? Never knew what it was when the movie was released here in the UK. Tim, I heard about the series, but I wasn't uh, aware how big the fan group in get the release here. It was released here in theaters too. And Tim Hens was surprised. Rob done a commentary for Moonraker. When did this happen? Well, <laughs> uh, I did it like four years ago, one summer day when I, I was hammered. I think it was before we did this show. Um, <laughs> uh, once again, you're you're out of sync, man. You are out of sync. Yeah, Hold on. Hold my... on. Let me see if I can put you back, back into sync. Let's see. Are you back in sync? That's just one, two, one, two. Better? Uh, Better. Yeah, there you go. Better uh, you're... No, it's your connection. You... What's what's happening? I thought the Germans always have great connections. Yeah, but uh, tonight it's a little bit uh, wonky. Yeah. 
You know what it is? Whenever it's wonky, it's because the NSA or the Russian, the FSB or whatever, somebody's messing around. <laughs> you know, because, because they, they, they know how influential this show really is. And they're wondering why I'm talking to the German that you are. They're wondering. Yeah. Considering Blade Runner, we had a little bit of topic on Blade Runner. Video Hunter D goes theatrical, considering his, his favorite. Theatrical, European cut, final directors. Uh, he's got to have the voiceover. Okay? Actually, it's kind of it's kind of interesting watching you out of sync because it's like watching a, a foreign film dubbed. <laughs> Let's let's hope if the people watching later it will be, be in sync. Probably not. Victor Fontaine, let's get let's get physical media is absolutely a must view. It's double McShave considering the package I got with the damaged damaged goods last week. Glenn is supporting Dita's addiction. Yes, double he unfortunately did. And Chu Chan Chin said, great new segment, damaged goods, but it probably hopefully will be a one and done segment so this was the live chat from from last week well let's see we got a few uh a few more super chats that uh okay. that uh um sorry i'm so moist today folks hope you don't care <laughs> um uh uh yuka you Yuka, eucalyptus oh eucalyptus i'm like well, apparently i can't <laughs> read today um Eucalyptus says Netflix needs someone like Zaslav. Perhaps, maybe they do. I mean, who knows? Uh, I think I already said that Marcus Bisma thing. But Netflix could use. I think they, uh, again, a two hundred and twenty million dollar action film. You know, the Gray Man. Do they really need to spend that kind of money? Are they ever going to see a return? And why wouldn't they release that film worldwide? I bet they could garner with who was in it, even the international market in theaters. I bet they could get a four hundred million dollar gross on that. Never going to see that money. Don't know why. Um, 200 Watt Studio says Prey was low key for the first act world building and getting to know the characters. The main character wasn't perfect, but you understood her. And it's an actual predator film. It's extremely violent. That's true. Um, that's what you want from a predator movie. You want people being torn asunder by an alien with, with bladed weapons. <laughs> um, Tom, Tom in, in, informs me, uh, that I'm, I'm not only out of sync, but your mic is clipping. That was in the live chat last week. Do I hear you fine, Rob? I hear no clipping whatsoever. That my mic is clipping? So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hang on. Let me check. Um, it shouldn't be clipping. I can take my down or low. Let's. I'll just leave it here. Maybe it's, maybe it's not okay. clipping now. We'll see. It shouldn't be. Um, it depends if I'm speaking really close to the microphone. Um, hopefully that's better. So hopefully that's better. Okay. Uh, AJ Zyla, a.k.a. Dadpool, says, please watch Warrior Predator on YouTube. It is the real prey. I believe that's a fan film. That's a Predator fan film. Okay. And the thing about that is, is I've heard that. People have said that, that it's very similar in terms of what it's about. But the funny thing is, is it's a fan film. You know, you always risk getting ripped off when you do something like that because you don't have the rights. But, um, yeah. hey. Uh, I want to watch that. People keep saying that. 200 Watt Studio says Monster Zero is the coolest Godzilla film. Nick Adams' dialogue is fantastic. I always thought it was the coolest Godzilla film. It, it peters out at the end, but it's still it's still really good. You know, I still really, really enjoy it. Uh, Echo Base, the, our friends at the Echo Base Network say, Rob, I just want to say watching 4K HDR content on this new LG limited edition OLED Star Wars TV with Atmos is absolutely epic. What TVs do you guys watch your physical media on? Well, let me just tell you, Echo Base Network, I'm kind of pissed. At, I have an LG 4K OLED, and I've got a, a Dolby Atmos surround sound system here. But that Star Wars limited edition TV, I would have bought that shit. It's, <laughs> it's cool, man. I mean, I'm like, why did... Uh, you know, I was hooking up some new electronics in here, and I, I got a 65-inch. I don't know how. I don't know if it's 65-inch. I saw a box for it. It looks 65 inches. I can't. I, I, I can't go under 65 inches. I'm a, I'm a size queen. 65 inches is as small as I go. Yeah, I can't go smaller than 65. Um, but I don't have it. Uh, Michael Preston says I don't understand the Batgirl write-off. Does this mean they can never show it or release it on physical media ever? 
Well, if they're taking the write-off, it means they can't, but that doesn't mean they can't then release it later at some date and pay off what they wrote down on it. Um, but yeah, you're probably never going to see that. Although what they do when they do that is they create the desire. I remember, I remember when Brooke Shields starred in another comic book adaptation, Brenda Starr, and you could not get that. It didn't get released, and then five years later, you could find it on like bootleg tables at conventions. It wasn't worth it. It wasn't good, but you could get it. I mean, I, you know what? I, I'm going to say something controversial. I think that Leslie Grace looked great, but if that 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 picture when she's kind of looking over her shoulder, that motorcycle Batgirl outfit, not good. You know, we we now live in a time where where especially with the MCU, if you love the MCU or you like the MCU, I think nobody can do- deny the fact. The costumes that they come up with, they're redolent of the comics, but they're also, they work in the real world. I mean, everything, you go back and you look at the Captain America costume from Captain America, the first Avenger, not his USO when he looked like the classic comic. I mean, you can see when they gave him the classic comic look and then they gave him yeah. sort of like that paramilitary look that he fought, he fought with, he fought with his commandos in World War II. That was a great reinvention of the Captain America costume that looked terrific. And then you get to the first event. I mean, you get to Avengers, and he's got that great blue costume that we later saw in uh, Endgame. They do a fantastic job with costumes. And I think for the most part, the DC universe has as well. But that Batgirl costume didn't, didn't work for me at all. Okay. And, and I think if that was indicative of the rest of the movie, there's a reason why that movie, that we're not going to see it. You know, I don't want to be petty. I I think what I, Rob, I remember Peter. on your on your on your on your documentary of Superman Returns uh, about how much testing you did for Superman Returns. Yeah, oh yeah, for the for the costume. Oh, and we saw a little bit about uh, about that. You know, and there was a lot of people that bitched and moaned and complained about that costume. And okay. you know, Brian Brian in the costume department, they had all the different iterations of the S and all the different iterations of the costume, and they were. They were going for this sort of mid-century art deco or early 20th century art deco vibe. And I thought it actually worked. It worked pretty – I thought it worked pretty good. I mean, um, I think it worked for the movie. The problem is even Brandon Ralph was kind of more had like a swimmer's body. So it was hard to get to get the costume to look like, say, Henry, Henry Cavill's got a much more classical Superman physique. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you know, it's 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 interesting because everyone's like, I want it to look like the comics. But if you were to take a comic book and translate that into the real world, you wouldn't like it. You know, the closest thing they came to really was Superman the movie, uh, which was which was actually pretty great. But it was pretty great because it fit Christopher Reeve. And I don't think you could get away with that now. I don't know. Maybe you could. What do you think? Considering the, the, the costume, yeah. Uh, but you should have done test in the testing phase, get to some result that you were comfortable with. It's you know? true. But it's for true. me, it's just the movie was just uh, all, almost finished, you know. And we all survived bad movies, you know. One, one or yeah, less but I, more. I, I, but, you know. you know, I think that David Zaslav, I think the point, the real point here is that this movie is going to cost us $100 million, and what return are we going to get? You know, the, the, the real problem that I think people need to understand is with streaming services, if you're releasing a movie directly to HBO Max, other than having content, it's like you don't get any return. You spend $100 yeah. million, and the only return that you get is if you get more subscribers, and you keep those re- subscribers. You get the subscribers and then retain those subscribers and the problem that the streamers are having is that how do you do that if you're making and 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 the thing about hbo max is they do release their movies on physical media they do release them around the world for people that don't have hbo max they license them out so they can make movies that way but for the most part how do you get a hundred million dollars back and if you the only way to get it back is through subscribers and they can't spend that much money on content anymore you know, and I think HBO probably sees a much bigger uptick in subscribers from people who are going to watch, say, House of the Dragon. You know, the new the new Game of Thrones series. Mm-hmm. They'll get yeah. those people and they'll retain them for at least ten weeks, 
why they watch the series. And I think that's that's the real problem here is that we're we're now living with an economic model that has been proven to not work. You know, I was reading an article this morning about how Netflix was considered a tech company when it really wasn't. And now what's happening is after all this, it was it was the value of the company was overinflated. <laughs> Excuse me, was overinflated. Of- and now they're not seeing it so much as a tech company as it is a more traditional entertainment company. And I think that, that that sort of needed to happen because why is Netflix spending $220 million on an action movie that I joked you could do the same thing. You could make Stone Cold, <laughs> you know, get Craig Baxley <laughs> to direct it. Don't get, I mean, Brian Bosworth and Lance Henriksen, and it would give you, look, I, here's, here's what I would say. The action is much lesser, but in terms of time, is a movie like Stone Cold admittedly a B-movie with Brian Bosworth, a former football player, going undercover into a biker gang? If you take the same amount of time, the same 90 minutes or two hours, which movie has more entertainment value? One costs two hundred and twenty million. One probably costs five or six. And and, and yeah. I mean, when you start thinking <laughs> in those kind of terms, it's like, mm, what's what what's really the most valuable? Yeah. Just a thought. Just so a thought. Where, where uh, are we at now? Uh, Doctor Martin Van Nostren said, uh, "My audio is perfect. Now yours is, is very low." <laughs> <laughs> oh, should I, should I, should I turn we my... Can't, we can't get the level level to a... Uh, well, this is my normal equal, level. Equal footing. Okay. Now it should be normal. Okay. So. So, uh, where do we start from? Physical media. Oh, well, I have a lot. I can start okay. showing some things. Now, uh, one yeah. of the things I forgot, it fell off where I, it was just on the floor. Uh, my last Vinegar Syndrome purchase, a movie that... A movie, by the way, that I saw at the Seattle International Film Festival that I thought was, in a way, lost forever because I've been talking about this movie for a long time and people looked at me like I was crazy. This this movie's insane. And it is, of course, the musical Voyage of the Rock Aliens. And it stars Nightbreed, Nightbreed, uh, or A River Runs Through It's Craig Schaefer and Pia... Zadora. This is an 80s musical about aliens that come to Earth. It's like a new wave 80s pop musical. I don't know if I would call it good, um, but it is interesting. <laughs> and, I, and I just <laughs> want to say the least. And, and again, Vinegar Syndrome, I haven't cracked it open, but you know, they did a yeah. great job. They've got the O ring, the matte finish O ring. I love Vinegar Syndrome. Awesome. If you yeah. want, if you like crazy cult movies, this movie is a crazy cult movie. And if nothing else, watch the trailer. It's a lot of fun. Voyage of the Rock Aliens. Um, I also got this. The Fabulous Baker Boys. A movie I love Ooh. with Jeff Bridges and Bo Bridges and Michelle Pfeiffer. I've always loved this film. I didn't even realize this had come out. It came out. From I which company, it. Rob? Um, this is from Paramount, I think. Is it from Paramount? Uh, no. You know what? It's MGM... Uh, oh, you know what? This came out from MVD. M- th- this is why. Oh. MVD is a, one of these crazy companies. And speaking of MVD, yeah. uh, these are, I got these at the same time. Also, Miami Blues with Alec Baldwin. This is another MVD. I guess another MV. Yeah, this is also MGM. So these, first of all, this is like some terrible video cover. And this is, of course, the actual yeah. key art. So MVD put both of these out. And... Um, I'm a huge fan. I mean, they even made this look like a video box with this, this right exactly. here, this yeah, sticker. Yeah. Um, I really like this movie, crime thriller. Uh, this is um, this is actually a really good movie, and uh, so is this. So MVD are putting out apparently uh, weird MGM titles. So I was happy to get that. And then speaking of MGM, because their catalog is a mess, Kino Lorber put out a new Mario Bava Planet Ooh. of the Vampires disc. I don't know what the fuck this cover is. Have no idea. This this is just as bad as the Poltergeist cover. Uh, but I love Planet of the Vamp. It's pretty bad. I yeah. love Mario Bava. Mario Bava also made, of course, movies like Bay of Blood. He was an incredible cinematographer. Uh, he he directed movies like Danger Diabolic or just Diabolic, uh, and of course, Mask of the Demon, or as we know it, Black Sunday. 
Huge fan of Mario Bava's. This movie was definitely an influence for Alien, the original Alien. And I already have this on Blu-ray, but this is a remaster. It's got some more special features on it. Had to get it. Um, love this film Perhaps so it has much. a different cover on the inside? You know what? I haven't even popped it up. Let's find out. That's what's so great about this show. If you if you don't like if you don't like the, well, the I boring, hate this. Perhaps. I hate this exterior cover, it, and it can't be worse. So, uh, let's check it. Nope, it's still this god awful no. cover. No. You know what I might do? I might check my to, old. Check Rob if you can. If oh, you, oh, can you, change you, want me, you want me to open it up? No inlay, inlay, the inlay. No. Oh, actually, uh, being that this is Kino Lorber, you're correct. And you're right. That's oh, what I'm gonna do. there you go. go. I'm going to do that. I'm going to change this cover. Hang on. Let me just. Uh... And this is. The, I mean, this this cover is the original uh, key art. Um, there you go. So, which is still lame, but it's better than this god awful whatever. I, I mean, I don't even. <laughs> you know. Oops. Put this in. So, thank you, Kino Lorber. So that's good. Thanks for pointing that out, Dietz. Nice. Uh, then this. This is a movie I haven't seen. Cat in the Bag. Um, this is a Dennis Ooh, Hopper nice. movie. Out of the blue. Linda Mance stars in this movie from Days of Heaven. Uh, Dennis Hopper directed this. I love Dennis Hopper's, like, the hot spot. Uh, never seen this movie. This came out uh, from Severin. And um, looking, forward, looking forward to checking this out again. Love these small companies and what they're doing. Then, of course, you know because of you, Dietz. Oh, awesome. Uh, I had to get this. Pleasure. You know, because why not? Yeah. Why not get some pleasure? You have to check it, Rob. I want to know what you. What oh, you I'm gonna watch. I can't wait to watch it. Um, God, it would be it would be a great great list of you watch. Oh, ooh, okay. It's we'll pleasure. watch it. That's a yeah. good one. Uh, <laughs> out of sight, the 4K out of sight from Kino Lorber, uh, which uh, have you I, checked it, Rob? Considering the transfer, I have, and I you know I see where um, where like Tom from Midnight's Edge was talking about, yeah. but I think that was definitely intentional. You know, it it, it was okay. I think it was okay. the way it was. Meant to be shot. Uh, I finally got this. I didn't get the steel book because I already have the Japanese steel book that I'm going to use. Edge Ooh, it tomorrow. Nice. Uh, this is great, but I'm going to put this actually in my Japanese steel book because the Japanese steel book is Cliff Stevens and God of Me is all you need is kill. Uh, and then here's a movie I don't think is particularly great, but William Friedkin directed it, The Hunted, which Ooh, uh, okay. which I had to get Benicio del Toro's Benicio in del Toro. it. Uh, when uh, Sherry Lansing, William Friedkin's wife, was at Warner or uh, Paramount, he he would get jobs like Blue Chips and The Hunted, so I had to get that. And then of course, everything everywhere all at once. Got this in 4K, uh, great movie. Nice. And so that's I was kind of catching up, and that's I got more to show, but I'll throw it over to you. Okay, I only have four titles this week. Okay, no. The first one is from. It was only a, a week, <laughs> a week between the, the two shows. Rob. From Hong Kong. Cat in the back, you know. VR fighter, is this called? Ooh, okay. So, just cat in the back. Hope it's good, you know. It's not particularly long. I think only only eighty minutes. So, hope a lot of it will be spent on action. The next one I already bought the eighty-eight collection of the series, but I had to get the four K of the first one. Of species, and I was uh, <laughs> surprised that it is a three disc set, considering the extras are all uh, gotten out onto the first. You you, disc you, you, you didn't set. you didn't go for the whole the whole four, four disc set. For I, I bought the eighty eight one, Rob. You know, but it was not a four K set. It was oh. just the Blu rays, and I got this, and then you know the announcement came that Short Factory is releasing species, and you have a reversible cover underneath it and it is a three disc three disc set the next one i watched yesterday american release but it is an italian film mondo Cana. oh yeah mondo Cana. yeah yeah is, it called? is that the original nice... like from like the, the 70s or something the 60s no rob this is a new new italian movie you know the cover is a little bit reminiscent of rob's favorite movie it's a dystopian future a little oh bit. okay, uh, but perhaps not too far, and really dug it a little bit. Lord of the Flies, a little bit Mad Max, and strangely enough, it came out in the in America first. Even if it's an Italian movie, the Italian release will be I think next uh, week for it. 
Mm. So it's Italian. It's it's strangely enough, Rob, it's from Kino Lorber, which uh, normally they put out, you know, the old 4K stuff. So it's uh, strange that this came from Kino Lorber. Italian movie, Mondo Kane, uh, uh, Mondo Kana. Really loving. Mondo Kana is uh, translated into Dog World. Dog World is uh, mm -hmm. some, in some countries the, the English title of the of the movie. Dog World. Mondo Kane. I have, no, I have uh, a special edition left for perhaps later, Rob, a little special. Okay, uh, the Alex Zorba became yeah. a member of the channel. So thanks a lot, okay. Alex. Very much appreciate that. For Welcome to the club. Uh, Dietz, we got news. I, yeah. Do you want to hear some news? Hit me, with, hit me with the news, Rob. Well, okay, Second Sight announced a new, you know how we love Second Sight, this new movie, Bull, which I'd never heard of. Uh, this is a... a an action revenge film. A man comes home to take revenge. Again, look at this. I, I it looks great. I I uh, I mean, this obviously Second Sight does a great job, um, which is awesome. Now, Shout Factory, of course, this is out in Europe, but Shout Factory re uh, announced that they're, they're doing Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure in 4K, which is exciting. And uh, <laughs> the last detail, which has some of the greatest. Of profanity in any movie ever. Hal Ashby's The Last Detail with Jack Nicholson. I thought this was an interesting but very welcome release from Shout. And of course, maybe the most fun thing Shout announced is the 4K of Return of the Living Dead. Everyone loves this movie. It's a punk zombie film. Uh, Linnea Quigley made her big screen splash in this movie. It has a great soundtrack. And um, really, really love this film a lot, so that's very exciting. Uh, of course, Elvis, Baz Luhrmann's Elvis was announced for 4K. It has a different cover than the DVD does, um, so this is exciting that this is coming out. And then, of course, this is kind of interesting. Uh, a Born 20th anniversary collection. This is the Born set. It has all the Born movies, but then it comes with like his backpack, and uh, it's got a full size backpack in it, a monocular for spy tools. Uh, Yeah, they're probably not new transfers, but hey, it's you know it's the 20th anniversary yeah. box set. I just think coming with all this swag is kind of kind of hilarious. Dog tags. I mean, you know, I mean it's cool. I'm not going to buy this because I have the Born box set, but it's it's kind of you know it's kind of it's kind of funny for people who want it. And then this was kind of interesting. In Britain, they're putting out uh, Watership Down. BFI is putting out Watership Down, the great animated film in 4K. I really love this movie. I have the Criterion version. Uh, this box set with all this swag in it uh, looks like it'll definitely be worth buying. So um, why not? You know, why not get that? And so those deets are the things that were announced that I thought were worth sharing. There's obviously a lot more stuff that's been announced, but those 4K discs were something that um, I really thought were, were worth sharing. And then, of course, disc sales. Uh, oops, I forgot to fill these in the frame, but you can read them. The top 10 Blu-ray bestsellers for this week, ending July 30th. Doctor Strange, number one. Doctor uh, Number two is The Lost City. Three, Green Lantern, Beware My Power, the animated film. Number four is Fantastic Beasts. Number five is Everything Everywhere All at Once. Number six is The Bad Guys. Number seven is Morbius. Number eight is Spider-Man No Way Home. Number nine is Downton Abbey, The New Era. And number 10 is The Batman. So, you know, not exactly um, nothing there that's really, yeah, it, it doesn't, didn't change much. Green Lantern's new. This is the top five media sellers. This is overall, including DVD as well. Doctor Strange, The Lost City, Fantastic Beasts, Green Lantern, and Downton Abbey. Then, of course, we have uh, top five 3D discs, deets. People still buying. Again, it hasn't really changed. Jurassic World, Dune 3D, The Meg 3D, Top Gun 3D, which is actually a pretty good 3D, 3D conversion, and Pokemon Detective Pikachu. And finally, heading up the rear, the top five 4K discs. Again, Doctor Strange, Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Batman, Green Lantern, the, and The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. So, I mean, three of those are superhero movies, and um, one's a Nicolas Cage movie. So those are... None of those are really surprising. So there's the news that's fit to print for this week. Only one thing to add, Rob. 
Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is already out here. Yeah, that's what I said in Europe. It's, it's in, already out in, in 4K. In Europe, yeah. yeah. From Studio Canal here. Yep. So they're finally getting around to doing it. And, you know, they're, they're doing that. Like, Shout Factory is taking a lot of those Studio Canal versions, like the John Carpenter movies. Yeah, and exactly. Putting them out. So not surprising. Not surprising. So, Rob, I have one letter to read. Ah, you do. Well, uh, lay it on us. Yeah. Uh, because someone had reached out to me personally. And I have some back and forth transmission with him on Instagram. So I hope I don't butcher his name later. It comes from Miroslav Lakicin. And he said, hello, Rob and Dida and the whole post geek singularity. You guys are the best buddy. Hang on. Deep, hold on. Uh, uh, yeah. You are the best. Go back because there was a glitch in the matrix. Okay. Glitch in the matrix. Okay. Hello, Rob and Dieter, and the whole post geek singularity. You guys are the best buddy cup duo on YouTube. <laughs> I'm a fan of RB ever since the Collider Hero days. Mm. Love everything the former the network brought. I stopped collect f- physical media 10 years ago because here in Serbia, it's very expensive to collect. Uh, also, Blu ray inlay covers are kind of cheap and crappy. Uh. So, I only collect figures and omnibus comics. Mm. My question for Rob is, will we will we ever see Blu-ray of Angel TV series? That is my favorite show. And season five is something I rewatch every few years. Even my email is named after one of the episodes in season five. Keep on making awesome content, guys. And greetings from small village of Itvor in Serbia. Either sorry for making up, uh, for ma- mixing up Saarbrücken with Zweibrücken, which is another town <laughs> in uh, Germany. Auf, auf Wiedersehen, uh, meine Freunde, from Miroslav Lakici. So, Rob, I have no idea about Angel. Well, that, it's it's TV really interesting. Anytime soon. So, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer was converted to HD, yeah. and it was horrible. It was mm. just an absolute travesty. Uh, uh, really, just just really, really bad. Now... I don't know much about. I, I think those were shows that were the post production was completed on video, which means that there's no negative, which means they have to go back into. They would have to go back into the negative and and redo it like they did with Star Trek: The Next Generation, like they did with X Files. So for those of you who don't know, there were a lot of shows in the '80s and '90s. In order to cut costs, they were shot on film. But they did all the post-production on videotape. And they did the post-production on videotape at our video standard, which is the NTSC format. So basically, imagine this. The, the eight, eight regular HD is about six times better than NTSC was. Yeah. And then 4K is basically sort of six times better than that, than, than HD. So... NTSC video is garbage. It's really hard to watch now. And because the television standard, the broadcast standards were much lower than they are now. So there's a lot of shows, favorite shows of mine, like the 80s, the mid 80s Twilight Zone revival, which it just looks terrible because it was not only was it finished on videotape, but it was also the visual effects were done on videotape and they look terrible. No one's going to go in and remaster that. What they have to do is They'd have to go into the original negative and retransfer the original negative in HD and then reassemble, basically take the show through post-production again. And unfortunately, Angel was on the, the back end of that, and I don't know if they'll ever go back and remaster those shows. The remastering of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Joss Whedon wasn't involved, nobody was involved, and and uh, it looks just... It's Which company at- did that trope? I don't remember. I mean, I think it was Fox proper, but... Uh, okay. uh, the real problem is with cost cutting measures it's it's laborious and it's expensive because and I keep getting people like people are all well what if we used a- AI and upresing the, the problem is the original information is is contained in the negative and if unless you're going to go do it you know you got to go back to the original negative cuz that's how the image was originally captured and work from that the problem is you have to go back and then somebody has to grab all that negative you have to scan it you know, on a machine and scan the negative and then color time that and then reassemble the show. 
And it is incredibly labor-intensive. That's what they did with Star Trek The Next Generation. It took four years to do all 178 episodes, and it cost between 12 and $14 million to do it. And the question is, there's, the question is twofold. Who's going to pay for that, and how are they going to get their money back? And when Star Trek, the Motion, or Star Trek The Next Generation was done, you had three different vi- divisions of Paramount kicking in to pay for it. So that's why Deep Space Nine and Voyager do not exist in HD is because they would have to go back and do the same thing. And, you know, people say to me, well, Rob, if it's the way we can get it in HD, we'll just use deep AI and, and uh, up-res what we've already got. And I'm like, but that's the wrong way to do it. It'll never look as good because AI is working off, there's no detail there. Everything is a smudge, it's a mess. And I guess you can magically tell the computer and we'll have enough computing power that we'll be able to do all the episodes, but they'll never look as good as they would if you go back to the original negative. The problem is you need a team of people doing it. And CBS Digital and people they farmed out to took them four years to do one show. And so the real question is, is there value there? I would say with the Star Trek franchise, there is. And they, they, they have been, I don't know how far along this is, but there was they were making inroads to doing Deep Space Nine, but they wanted to do it on the cheap. Everybody doesn't have the money to spend because how do you get that money again? How do you get that money back? You know, if you do Deep Space Nine, you spend $20 million doing it because you're going to have to up-res the CG as well. And let's say it costs you $20 million to do, I think there's 772 episodes of Deep Space Nine. You do all that, how are you going to get your money back? If you spend $20 million, where does that $20 million, first of all, come from in the first place? People think, well, Paramount, can't they, or CBS, can't they just afford it? They still have to come up with $20 million. <laughs> and, and where do you come up with $20 million? You know, the studios don't have this magical cash machine that they could just go take $20 million from. They have to account for all that. And then once they do that, how are they going to get that money back? I mean, the problem is it's the, it's the same problem that everyone else has. Uh, they no longer have licensing deals. Paramount Plus wants to have Star Trek as its crown jewel. So you're just sticking it on streaming now. Before, they would license it out to everybody. But now you're just going to put it on Paramount Plus. How does Paramount Plus justify the $20 million spend on Deep Space Nine and the $20 million spend on Voyager, I would say, well, those shows are going to be watched forever, so spend the money. The same way that the reason Netflix paid $100 million for one year of Friends back in 2019, Star Trek will always be, people will always be watching it. They will always be, you'll always, it'll be perennially watched, and it'll be one of the reasons you keep subscribers is because of Star Trek. But then again, then you have to find the team to do it. And if you're going to do Deep Space Nine and Voyager, which they should have done in the first place, along with TNG, you've got to find the people to do that work. And it's hard. And the same is true with Angel and Buffy. They should go back to the negative and redo those over and over again. But now with Joss Whedon, where he's at, where he's been sort of disgraced because of the allegations that came out about the way he treats people, is anybody going to go do one of his shows and remaster it? I would say, what, what does that matter if we love Angel and Buffy? Does Joss Whedon's involvement in it stop people from enjoying the shows? I don't know. I think it's an interesting philosophical question, but I don't know if I don't know if I don't know if uh, Angel ever will be remastered. I think it should be because it's. I think it's a seminal show, and I think it'll always be if it's available, people will watch it. So, but but don't ask David Sesla for the money to read. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so Echo Base Network also sent yeah. in his chat and asks, have you heard anything else about a possible DS9 HD box set released? I believe mm-hmm. that was another show done on VHS. Well, yeah, it's not done on VHS, but VHS quality. They have made inroads. People are doing tests. Um, I haven't actually heard a confirmation that DS9 is moving forward, but there are people, uh, HTV and Illuminate uh, wanted to do it. And they, they're the people that did the X-Files. And they did a pretty good job with X-Files. They also worked on season two of TNG. We'll hopefully see that. Now, we've got another super chat that has come in. Uh, big Disc Energy. <laughs> I see what you did. That's funny. Uh, can we get Dieter's review of Stranger Things 4? Season 4. My review of Stranger Things 4. I quite enjoyed it. Uh, the only thing I would say they should probably finish Stranger Things with that season and that two and a half hour finale because I don't quite know if there's more gas left in the tank 
for season five for the show. So I quite enjoyed it, even if there were multiple stories uh, uh, playing at the at the same time. So it was really a lot of skipping from one one scene to the next. But for me, great show, greatly done. So for me, I would say eight point five out of ten for the for season four as as a whole, considering Stranger Things uh, four. But I would have closed closed the show there. But season five, when it's exactly as good as season four, why not? Why not? Yeah, I I, I mean, why not? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, Stubble McShave says if Batgirl wouldn't add any yeah. subscribers, this is a good point Stubble's okay. making. If Batgirl wouldn't add any subscribers, then it's a ninety million dollar loss, even if some people watch it. If they can get back fifty, mil- if they can get back fifty million of that in a tax write-off, then they take a smaller hit financially. And if it's subpar in quality, it also hurts the value of the brand. Well, Stubble is exactly right. I mean, that in a nutshell, that's what's going on there. You know, is but it? But you have to de- de- decide ahead, ahead of time. Will this be a movie for streaming or theatrical release? Mm-hmm. This was just in that in that in that tiptoeing realm. Okay, it was announced for HBO Max, then it gotten perhaps too big. Or okay, we could do a theatrical release, then it's not good enough. So, well, I think yeah. you know. Uh, again, you have to think that if you're going to release a Batman movie theatrically, Matt Reeves the Batman and Todd Phillips Joker, those are the standard bearers. If you're if you're not going to make a movie that can stand next to those two movies, whether you like the movies or not, you yeah. have to concede that they're beautifully made, and there's a real vision there. They have a real look. They look prestigious. And if you're going to release something that is that is below those films in quality, then you are hurting the brand. You're hurting the brand at a theatrical level, and I think that was the real problem. And first of all, if you're making a movie for streaming, I'm sorry. Even though I'm a you know, I, I've only produced, I've only worked in the low-budget arena. Even I would never greenlight a $100 million movie that's going direct to streaming. It makes no sense from an economic standpoint. I mean, I would bring back, you know what I think streaming needs? Streaming needs to not look at big-budget studio movies. Streaming needs to go back and look at like what new, I, I hate to say it, I'm going to bring up Stone Cold again. I would much rather watch or movies like Jack Shoulders the Hidden. You know, the alien yeah. movie that knew make movies like that. Make movies for ten million or less that are really smart, really interesting, and really gonzo. You know, whether they're bl- they're full of or uh, uh uh what is it, till death what was the, the where the woman's getting married in the till death there was part or um you know that she was getting married and then the family has to yeah play a game they try and kill each other they have to uh, try and kill the bride uh, I, know, I, I know i did I, I i reviewed it, it's the beginning of my promo um yeah. but but that movie was a lot of fun or the movie you know um, um exactly. why aren't you dead you know the russian film with the coming to the door with the hammer yeah you know why don't you just die why don't you just die you just, like yeah. make those movies for streaming because people would watch those they don't cost a lot of money and and but you have to find people that know what they're doing. That's what I would love to see the streamers do: is go back and think about it from an exploit. They make all those those teen romance movies for no money. Yeah, and those movies do really well. You got to start making your action genre films more like those. You know, more like uh, uh, or over the top stuff. So you can't compete. I mean, a two hundred twenty million dollar action movie like like uh, the Gray Man. I mean, hey, it's well made, but it was surprisingly just like, eh. The other movie, Eucalyptus, Ready or Not, was the title. Wrong. Ready or Not, that's Ready, right. Ready or Not. Yeah. Ready or Not. Thank and you, Eucalyptus. That movie was a hell of a lot of fun. Exactly. You know, and streamers exactly. should be going after those, I think. Anyway, yeah. that's just me. By the way, uh, Marcus Bisma also asks, um, what are your thoughts on streaming service 4K quality? Uh, considering I... Still have not a 4K TV. I just can say, pray, looked, and sound awesome. Mm. Here's the thing. It's always getting better. Streaming is always getting better. But I do think picture is still better on discs. It's the sound. Frequently, I notice the sound is 
not nearly as good as it is on physical media discs. Yeah. It's compressed. I mean, they always skimp out on the sound because most people don't have home theater systems. So they feel they can get away with it. And, and I, I, I think they, it's probably kind of true. <laughs> so, yeah. but, but Bray, Bray, but Bray did, did sound, sound awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, great, getting, great it's getting better design. all the great time. Sound design, Rob. You, will, you will, will love it. Love it. So, yeah, so do you want to share your, your so, special edition? Yeah, my special edition. Before I get to the special edition, Rob, I seen, I brought out the Innocence last week, and I've uh, seen, Rob, it will come out in America in October, I believe. Oh, on okay. Blu-ray. So the tip for me, Innocence in the U.S. at October on Blu-ray. And just considering uh, streaming stuff, this afternoon I finished the Orville season three with the oh, ten episodes. What did you think? I I loved it. Yeah, totally fine. The only thing, Rob, uh, considering the new ensign that she didn't survive. Spoiler alert: the third season was a little bit of bummer because have you seen Anne Winters? Okay, you know, hubba hubba, you know. She he's yeah, she's eyes, very cute. You know? Very cute. Yeah. But really nice, really nice third season. And considering that the show for me started a little bit off more like a parody or homage to Star Trek, and then slowly gotten rid of of the the humor more, more and still is humor in it, but not to the extent it was at the beginning of the first first two seasons. Totally. So it's gotten e- even even more like a copy of Star Trek. But considering the running time of the uh, individual episodes were really surprising because there was not one that was under one hour. So it's always 60 minutes or even even longer, considering. Do we know anything? Will it get a, a fourth season, Rob? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't think we know if it has a fourth season pickup. Man, that third okay. season, I, I really loved it. I thought it was, it was great. And boy, did they spend a lot of money on it. The production values were great. The scripts were thought-provoking and interesting. I, I really, really love the characters. I hope they do a fourth season. And I totally love the ending, Rob, because if you don't get another season, it would be a fine ending that you can, can live with if you don't get another season. Yes, I agree. We, they, did, they didn't la- left us with a, with a cliffhanger. And considering that I'm a sitcom fan, on Hulu I watched the show Maggie, which was not that bad. She is a psychic and can see the future, Rob. So if she touches someone, she can see some vision in the future, which gets a little bit problematic considering her relationships. You know, even th- she can always figure out how she, how you can interpret the, the vision correctly. You know, it was not not that bad, Maggie. That was the stuff I watched this week on streaming, and I showed it already. Uh, I don't know if you did get around, or I think it will come out at the end of August. In the states, the movie Bell. Which yeah, I've said, got the I special totally edition, the 4K special yeah. edition on order. I can't wait to get that on disc. Yeah. I saw the movie, liked the movie, and I told you this is a little bit too flimsy for me. I want another edition of the movie, and from the uh, label that brought you the Tune edition, Rob Koch Films. But Koch Films will change into Play On. So it will not be Cork Films anymore. It uh, will now be Play On. They released this nice box set. I haven't even looked what is in, inside. So this is a nice box set for Bell. Yeah, that looks exactly like what they're releasing in America. Yeah, wait. So yeah. So that's from Coke. Yeah, I got it. Right. Exactly, Rob. Exactly. But I haven't even opened it. So let's see. Let's open it, buddy. What we get. What we get inside so this was just the back of it then i got a limitation certificate which comes with the number it's limited to 4444 pieces then let me just see oh this this is really nice really heavy looks like a little bit more of a of a magnet mm. for it really nice here we have nice holographic stuff for that's cool the movie more than one actually okay the holographic effect doesn't it's hard tough to 
come across here. Really, really nice. Really nice. They really look great. Those are really neat. And I think it will come out in the States in, in different variations too. I'm not saying. So what do we have here? Okay, more like postcard. Wow. It's the, it's the big virtual reality. Let me know your your heart. So I, think I let you know to... my heart every week, Dieter. <laughs> Unveil the beast. Oh, a lot. Ah, that looks like a poster for the movie. Okay, this is the German one. The poster. Then this is a booklet for the movie. Which is, of course, since it's the German edition. This is, this is pretty cool. There's the lyrics of the songs in it, in the second booklet. And then we have, once again, this nice 3D graphic. That's great. That's the inside of the box, which has a print too. Let me just see if I'm... I know how to handle this. This is the outer shell, the O-ring around it. And it comes with five, five discs in it. We have the 4K, we have the Blu-ray. And what, what is great, it has the soundtrack of the movie, but not only original in the German dub, as well and i've heard it and it's really really nicely done and we have the bonus disc so a nice five disc set for the animated movie bell so i hope you will enjoy it too rob when it comes out in the in the states but this was my special edition rob well the animated movie bell. uh i like it I like it. Uh, I've got a few more things to show that I did pick okay. up. Uh, very proud. Very proud. Very. These are all very worthy <laughs> releases. Proud. Very proud that I'm proud of myself. Uh, you, have, very, if you, you know, uh, a blind chicken finds a crane rope. <laughs> <laughs> a, okay. Now, as you know, one of the great things about the, the age in which we live in is when cult or, or lesser known movies get put on 4K. And companies like Severin and Blue Underground, especially, uh, one of my favorite '70s movies comes to us from Larry Cohen, the writer-director of movies like Black Caesar, one of the movies that kicked off black exploitation. He made the It's Alive movies. He made Q, Q the Winged Serpent. Yeah, Q the Winged Serpent. Uh, but my favorite Larry Cohen movie by a wide margin is this. God told me Ooh. to and uh I, this I actually know that come up because Glenn Glenn did bought the, bought the same one I okay think. this if you haven't seen this movie the less you know the better it is violent it is crazy it's sacrilegious and it also crazily <laughs> enough has stock footage from space 1999 and and for whatever reason Actually, I, I, I used to sit, they used to seat me with Larry Cohen at the Saturn Awards. So I would talk to him every year. We had sort of an ongoing conversation for about almost 10 years. And I asked him once, I'm like, bro, how come there's, <laughs> how come you have stock footage from Space 1999 and God told me to? He's like, I, I didn't know it was from Space 1999. He had no idea. He just thought he was getting stock footage of an alien spacecraft <laughs> or something. And so, he, but, <laughs> but, uh, this this film is one of the great exploitation movies. If you've never seen this, and this is like, this is like, there's this film is so crazy, um, and I'm surprised not many people 
know it. It's kind of fallen. Of all the Larry Cohen movies, they talk about the stuff. They talk about original gangsters. They talk about the It's Alive movies, even uh, Return to Salem's Lot. But not a lot of people talk about this. This is by far Larry Cohen's best exploitation movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend this movie if you like 70s exploitation. Uh, because it's a lot of fun. Now here's... Okay. Now we're always talking about what 4K can do to a film. You know, when you get... And one of the one of the things that I've been uh, most appreciative is when photochemical movies, movies that were shot on film, get the, the 4K treatment, and the 4K treatment's definitive. Like, specifically, Jan de Bont, the director of Speed and, and Twister, Jan de Bont was Paul Verhoeven's cinematographer. Not just Paul Verhoeven, he shot other movies too, but... but um, Verhoeven shot, I mean, uh, Jan de Bont shot like Basic Instinct. He also shot Die Hard for John McTiernan. Die Hard always looked like shit to me on home video. They, they could never get his filtering right, and it was always very smeary until the 4K. The 4K of Die Hard is the definitive transfer. Um, Basic Instinct, it's too, it's too teal and orange for me. Maybe Lionsgate will get around to doing a new transfer, but even Cliff Stevenson told me there's people that are have an ideological problem with Basic Instinct because <laughs> the of movie. the depiction of... The movie, of, not the transfer. Yeah, the movie. It's like, come on, man. I mean, who doesn't love lesbians? Well, it's the... the, the I mean, first of all, you could say that any movie that's depicting any psychotic killer is somehow... I don't know. But um, I love Basic Instinct. I make no apologies for it. And I have to say the Studio Canal transfer that was one of my most eagerly awaited titles of last year... The transfer looks great, but the it does not retain what the tra- what the movie was supposed to look like. Speaking of Jan de Bont, one of the movies that I have a soft spot for, I was actually on the set. I was in the medical examination uh, set for this movie, which is patently ridiculous. But I love th- this movie is ridiculous, but I love it. And it was shot by Jan de Bont, and this 4K transfer coming out from Arrow looks fucking phenomenal. And that is oh, Joel Flatliner. Schumacher's oh. Flatliners. Uh, again, I don't know. I don't know what this cover is supposed to be, but it does have the original uh, key art, yeah. so you can do that. Even that's not so great. But this is like if if the Brat Pack. <laughs> to me, this was this was the last Brat Pack movie. <laughs> this is like <laughs> Saint Elmo's yeah. Fire if they all died and they came back from the dead, um, and Saint Elmo's Fire, another Joel Schumacher movie. So I love Flatliners. Uh, this is chock a block full of special features. I actually have this movie already as a weird steelbook release, but it looked like shit. This looks amazing. So if you're a Flatliners fan, Arrow, you gotta get this. You gotta get this. Hopefully next week, bro. Hopefully next. Week. Oh, you, it's you're gonna love it. It's great. Now, another movie that I've probably bought way too many times. One of my favorite Dario Argento movies. That this this came out from Synapse. This is the Synapse version. Dario Ooh, Argento's early '80s Tenebrae. Um, yeah, Ooh. I Ooh. now now this again. This comes from Synapse. God bless yep. Synapse. Yep. Uh, Don May. They did Synapse did the amazing Suspiria 4K disc. So I have not popped this on yet, but um, it does come with in addition to the discs. It comes with uh, there. Here, th- that's that was the original art, but uh, as Synapse does, you know, great booklet. I I love this movie. It has one of my favorite uh, like deaths. A guy gets his arm cut off and sprays a white wall with blood. It's awesome. I love it. Uh, to get this in 4K, I mean, Dario Argento obviously has been in decline for a long time, and this is kind of cool. I don't even know what this is. So this is. Um, one day, Dieter, I'm going to do something with, like, maybe I'm going to do a whole bathroom So, uh, in these, with these posters. Oh, this is pretty cool. So, here's, like, the original. This, this is the original poster, the European poster yeah. artwork. And then they've recreated. Uh, here's here's uh, J- from Japan. Japanese poster. Japan. Oh, nice. Uh, and, of course, this, this contains both the cut, the edited, like all Dario Argento's movies when they were brought to America in the 80s. The edited version, Unsane, which is not worth watching. But in case you want it, uh, it's here. And again, I mean, there's there's swag in here. There's cards in here. Awesome. Uh, this is a great, another great release from Synapse. Very happy to have this. I love, I love Tenebrae. It's, uh, it's great. 
And um, another great release from Synapse. You guys go. Synapse rules. Don May rules. One day we should have him, have him on the show. Now, my last thing that I want to show is something I've been very worried about, whether or not I could get it because it's sold out from the people who made it, and I didn't, I didn't buy it because I was a douche. I was a douchey douche. I don't know why. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. People are going to laugh, <laughs> but I, I, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I can quote the whole thing back to front. I even made a Super 8 movie uh, inspired by this movie. Now, this was a release from Australia's imprint. Now, it has subsequently, this is Blu-ray, it has been announced to come out on 4K. There's a 4K coming out, but I'll tell you what it is. I got to say that this movie came out in 1978. 78, 79, 70, maybe 79. Uh, it was directed by Walter Hill. It has a score by Barry DeVorzon. Uh, I love this movie so much, and I love this box, and I love this package. Ooh, come out and play. The Warriors come nice. out to play. Now, this is great. Great special this is edition. This theatrical version, Rob. Not well, now, here's the thing. Are they post? So on Blu-ray, they did this really weird. So this movie is actually based on a Greek myth believe it or not. And uh, I know people are like, what? But uh, I won't get into that. But so it is the, the the adventure of going home. But when this was released on Blu-ray, they released, Walter Hill did this really weird director's cut yeah. where he put in these weird these comic, interstitials. Comic these com it was bizarre. And I, I mean, I bought it because I love the Warriors. Um, so this actually has both uh, versions. Great, so it's a great. box set and uh, it's got both, both theatrical versions. Oh, I think I just, cut my thing so you've got this is the director's cut and here is the okay. original theatrical version now somebody nice. said that the music was different like the europe i haven't i haven't actually oh. put this on because i just okay. got this so i don't know the music cues license, in this are, license issues or okay. I, I don't know i don't know um but we'll see i mean i i want the original version of this movie like it, it's not like i haven't seen it enough in my life because i have but <laughs> you know, I didn't get this, and I actually got this from Zavi. Uh, I went to I nice. went to go buy this, and it was sold out. Kind of like, um, kind of like Vinegar Syndrome's uh, "They Call Her Wanna." I mean, um, thriller. Uh, thriller was sold out. Thanks, Doctor Howard Yang, for getting an extra. But so they just had this at Zavi, and I'm like, oh, I, it was probably more expensive or whatever. I went click, and they sent it to me. So now I have it. Now I have the Warriors. This is my favorite <laughs> thing I got this week because I love this movie so much, and to get the theatrical version on Blu-ray, and it's coming out the, in 4K. The, the, four, the 4K will contain both versions too, or just you don't know? I, I don't know. I mean, I would love to get it in 4K, um, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> uh, I, 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 again, I don't know. It's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Um, so that's 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 everything I had for the week. It was a pretty big week for me. Uh, I got what I wanted, thank God. Great. So, um, yeah, and now we got an, an extra super this chat this from Echo Base Network. Says, speaking of streaming, have you guys seen the documentary on Disney Plus, Light and Magic, about ILM? It was very well done, and I learned a lot. A plus plus, a must watch. I love this. Have you watched it? Light no, and Magic. But you told me about it. It's fantastic, and uh, I would suggest everybody if you have a cursory interest in Star Wars, or uh, or ILM, or George Lucas, or even science fiction films of the '80s. It is a tremendous six part documentary on the history of ILM. Very I'm very on good. Disney plus, Rob. Am I right? On what, yeah, plus? it's on Disney Plus. Okay. Okay. It's really good. Um. Uh, it's funny, Marcus Bisma says, can can the Warriors be remade today? Well, Tony Scott, before he died, was working on a, a modern Warriors remake. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if you could actually get away with remaking the Warriors, because in the Warriors, they have to take the trains to get from the Bronx back to Coney <laughs> Island, where they're from, and no one has a car. I mean... Nowadays, you just call an Uber and somebody would pick you up and take you home. Uber, exactly. So, I mean, they they, they, uh, they, they, they used the, the city became a jungle and they were being pursued by everybody. I don't know. like, And they wanted to, they wanted to remake the movie and set it in L.A. with L.A. gangs. I just, I just don't know how you'd have a problem getting somewhere in L.A. or getting hunted down. Everybody would just go in different directions. So, I don't know how they would do it. <laughs> but, um, hey, you can... Um, you can always remake anything, I guess. Um, so, yeah, Stubble Shave says that Light and Magic 
is a story about survival of the fittest. I totally agree. Uh, it really is. Uh, Adapt Humble Midnight's die. Edge was in the chat, and, and he said uh, the 4K will probably contain both cuts. Of, oh, that's good. Of the movie. It better. Um, so, I you know, I don't know when that's coming out or not. Um, uh, ooh. Uh, Columbia Classics, uh, Midnight's Edge. Tom asks about Columbia Classics Volume 3. I have the first two oh, box sets. Is there some announcement? I don't know. Um, he's asking, let's find out, shall we? Uh, Columbia okay. Classics Volume 3. I don't know. For those of you who don't know, there's two great box sets where Columbia released 4K movies that not all of them have come out in single disc releases. So you got Lawrence of Arabia in 4K. That was released as a single disc. Stuff like um, Jerry Maguire, A League of Their Own, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Social Network. Social Network on 4K, which I don't believe has come out as a singular version. Hang on. Let's see. Go on, so. Columbia Classics. Classics Volume 3. Let's see what I can I find out, Deets. Think, think about it. Uh, Columbia Classics. I'm, I'm seeing the first two. Uh, volume 3, Amazon. Oh, let's see. Columbia oh. Classics. Um, nope. Nope. Doesn't say. So I don't know. Volume 3. Digital Bits. Uh, let's see. If, if anyone knows, Bill Hunt would know. Oh, this, this was on Friday. Um, oh. So this is new news. I didn't see this. News. Uh, Columbia Classics Ultra HD Volume 3. Um, let's see what it says. Uh, we've also got some news today on Significant. Let's see. I didn't see this, but uh, I will find out. Mm, Star Trek The Motion Picture. That's coming out soon. Can't wait to get that. Um, let's see. I'm still, wait, I'm still looking. That's all for now. What does it say? Star Trek The Motion Picture, The Bionic Woman. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Uh, Columbia Classics Volume 3. Mm. Ah, here we go. You may recall that we mentioned on Monday that Sony Pictures Home Entertainment was working on a new Columbia Classics 4K Ultra HD Collection Volume 3 box set. Uh, and that our industry sources were indicating that as good as it gets... And from here to eternity, we're among the titles expected to be included. We've now learned from Spanish retail sources that Annie, Annie, the last picture show, and it happened one night, are likely to be included as well. Um, well, if that's true, I might not be buying Columbia Classics Volume 3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, I, I, I'd love to get the last picture show, but... From here to eternity, Tom, maybe, but I don't need that in 4K. Uh, it's black and white, not that it won't look great. Tom helps us out to Sir with Love is in it too. Oh, to Sir, okay. Um, oh, hi, Rob. Look at the chat. To Sir with Love, look, I, you know what? These, these are not films that I'm necessarily... They're good movies, but uh, it doesn't turn me on. I don't need those movies in 4K. I mean, for me personally. Uh, for from here to eternity is of course great. You're not going to get me to get excited about Annie in 4K because you know what, Dieter. While the sun will come out tomorrow, the disc will not rise on my DVD player. <laughs> 4K <laughs> disc player. <laughs> the sun will come out tomorrow, just not in the observatory. <laughs> there won't be one. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay. So. Yeah, won't be getting that. <laughs> PM <laughs> PM Ferrer says, what's wrong with Annie? Nothing's wrong with Annie. <laughs> I just don't ever need to see it again. <laughs> I'd rather watch God Told Me To for the 87th time. <laughs> there you go. So. Okay. Yeah, Midnight's Edge says, I was hoping for Tootsie. Fuck yeah, if Tootsie was in it, I would buy it. That would be a first day buy for me. Tootsie's one of my favorite comedies of all time. If that was in 4K, I would buy it. And it's not. How can they not put it there? They probably still... Uh, Tom says he's not impressed either. Um, yeah, not, not, not down. Not down. 
Way Haven't they do. done a, a selection through viewers again? What they want to see? In yeah, I guess. Stuff? I mean, that's what they did. And I'm like, I get it. Yeah, but, yeah. like, as good as it gets, I understand that's con- from her from here to eternity. Well, that's fine. And the last picture show is good. And it happened one night, I get. But that's, it happened one night. Here's the thing. Okay, this isn't to say that black and white movies can't look great in 4K. But, I mean, it happened one night from 1934. And that's fine. But do I, do I need that in 4K? I mean, I, I like to get every movie in 4K, but I don't... It does, that doesn't excite me. And from here to eternity, I've seen that a million times, too, from 1953. And even the last picture show is also in black and white. So three of those movies are black and white. Not that Ooh. we don't need great black and white in 4K or something, but if you're going to give me a 4K black and white movie, give me fucking Wings of Desire. That's what I want. Um, or Rumblefish. You know, or 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 um, or the original Beauty and the Beast that Henri Alacan shot. Give me something like that, or give me something like Seconds in 4K. I'd love to get that. Uh, anything that James Wong Howe shot, The Manchurian Candidate. Give me that in 4K. Come on, man. That's just me. Okay. I know Perhaps you're... Volume, volume 4 will be, will be better. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, the completist in me will be like, well, God, now I have to get Volume 3 again. It'll probably be like $500. Just just wait until the price drops for Schnäppchen. I don't know, man. No, those discs, those box sets have been selling out. They're yeah. not Schnäppchens. So... Exactly. What are you going to do? So I think we've gone through all, all our topics. Yeah, all the topics. The, you read the letter. We're done. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's good. So, let's hope the next week will be less t- tumultuous, considering water. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can't get any more tumultuous. Um, yeah. But other than that, yeah, this has been a, a fine show, Dieter. I don't know. There's not a whole lot coming yeah. out next week that I'm interested in getting. There's a few things. A couple of titles are coming out that are cool, but... Other than that, no. I think we're we're at the end of our journey today. Yeah. So, as always, I like to say, jede Person, die du triffst, hat eine Geschichte zu erzählen. Alles, was du tun musst, ist zuhören. Every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. I want to thank everybody that supports this channel generously through memberships, super chats, tips. Thank you so much. Keeps it all going. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being here and moderating along with Justin Toner. Uh, it's great that you guys do the great work that you do and stop those crazy bots from filling up our live chats with, with <laughs> gobbledygook um, and all that. So thank you for that. And I want to thank my co-host, of course, Dieter Bastian. It wouldn't be a show without him. And maybe next week uh, I won't just take a shower right before I go on the show and then not have air conditioning. So what can I say? Uh, my laser shirt needs to go to the laundry again. Yeah. Um, but other than that, Hey, I want to thank all of you guys for watching. You know, I should say like subscribe, all that stuff, but you already know, I never really say that on my channel. Maybe that's why it doesn't, you know, I slowly incrementally grow. We're closing in on 50,000 subscribers on this channel though. And I want to thank all of you really trying to get to 50,000. So I don't know why I don't get like one of those YouTube buttons. That's another 50,000 away, which is going to take another four years. I'll be dead soon, so I won't probably make that. But hey, maybe we will. <laughs> and I'll do it with all of you. Yep. Tomorrow I'm back on the John Campy show and uh, exactly. all that. Cool. So yeah. anyway. Just close out, Rob. I forgot it. Box office. Oh. A little bit. Mm. That You know Consider, what? Considering bullet train. Let's, oh, yeah. Let's check let's it out. Let's go to, uh, let's see. What, 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 the, what is the box office? I don't know. I haven't looked either. Um, because Bullet Train was the biggest movie. Uh, here we go. Uh, this no. is good. So here we're at the worldwide box office. Bullet Train. This is from Deadline. Nancy Tartaglioni wrote this. Bullet Train clocks 62.5 million global bow. Jurassic World Dominion mm-hmm. overtakes Doctor Strange 2. And Top Gun Maverick crosses 1.35 billion worldwide. Coming in just slightly ahead of pre-weekend projections, Sony's bullet train pulled into 57 overseas markets for $32.4 million. That was its box office launch when including the domestic start. 
The global debut for Bullet Train totally is $62.5 million. The Brad Pitt starrer rode to the biggest offshore opening for a non-IP studio film since Tenant. And its tracking is similar to Murder on the Orient Express and Kingsman, The Secret Service. As with stateside, audience reactions are beating critical notes, and there are still several key markets to come. Okay. So that's good. Um, and IMAX was 4.1 million of that. Um, the Universal Illumination film Minions, The Rise of Gru, had a solid hold. And it has now yeah. made, this is crazy, the overseas total crazy. is now for Minions... Four hundred and twenty-three point three million. <laughs> it has grossed seven hundred and fifty-seven point nine million global, and that's it's doing exactly what Minions and Despicable Me three did at the same point. Uh, DC Super Pets woofed up another eleven point four million, and its cum is now thirty-eight million and eighty-four or er, eighty-three point four million total worldwide. And here's rounding it out: Disney Marvel's Thor: Love and Thunder is on its way to 700 million worldwide with an estimated 699 million through Sunday. It had already overtaken Thor Ragnarok as the top picture of the four title franchise based on current rates and excluding Russia and China. And internationally, the gross is 382 million. And so there you go. Uh, It's still number one in Italy and number two. And then the big story, Top Gun Maverick. Still has the heat, and it grossed. It only gro- it only dropped twenty eight percent last week, <laughs> and it made ten point three million in weekend eleven. It has made six hundred and ninety million uh, internationally for one point three five two point five million, one or billion one Never billion three hundred and fifty two million five hundred thousand. That's incredible. It's incredible. The hold is incredible. People are loving this movie. Yeah. Um. And then finally, Jurassic World Dominion this weekend surpassed Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness to become the second biggest Hollywood release of 2022. Uh, it has made 960.1 million, including 588.2 million overseas. So it's right in line with Jurassic Park Fallen Kingdom and uh, excluding China and Russia. So there you go. A lot of good stuff. Okay. People are going to the movies, man. And, and- and nope uh, is still uh, getting that was international. I don't think nope has opened internationally no, it, yet. It ha- hasn't opened here, Rob, but I don't know the exact dates for the um, other European states. It hasn't hasn't opened here. Yet. Let's see. I'll, uh, nope is still nope is number three uh, in theaters, and it has made a total of ninety seven point five million domestically. Okay. That's pretty good. And there are international markets to go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's for the box office. That okay. is the box office. There you go. And uh, Black Phone has made yeah. $85.8 million. So that's a big hit for the amount of money it cost. Okay. It's good, right? It should be, it should be out on, on, on Peacock. In, yeah. It's out. In still making song. money, though. Okay. Great. Great to know. So, Rob? That's it. I guess we can log off. That's it. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks to everyone who watching the show. We will see you next week. Next hopefully. week. New, with new titles. Mm-hmm.